Torrential downpours hammered Toronto and drenched the GTA. Major flooding across the region. Tonight, services shut down, neighborhoods flooded, the power outages and the water rescues, the impact on a soaked city. Good evening. The images are incredible. Parts of the Don Valley Parkway completely underwater tonight. A month's worth of water coming down in just a couple of hours. A record amount of rain wreaking havoc on the streets and in people's homes. We have team coverage this evening with CTV's Raheem Ladani on the extensive flooding. Scott Lightfoot on major disruptions to the afternoon rush. And CTV's Beth McDonnell on the extensive cleanup that homeowners are faced with. We'll start with Raheem live on the lakeshore tonight. Raheem. Nathan and Michelle, good evening. We're here on the lakeshore between Strawn Avenue and British Columbia Road. Behind me, you can actually see the roadway. That was not the case for over five hours today. It was completely flooded and shut down to traffic in both directions. And it's just one of the many areas that has been impacted by today's rainstorm. Stuck in bumper deep waters. Those near High Park who tried to splish and splash their way through the pools on the road were quickly forced to abandon their car. I was driving and the car just stuck because it's like so much water, it's so deep. A similar scene on the lake shore with vehicles wading through the torrential downpour before police shut down traffic in both directions. But not everyone's choosing to risk it. I'm waiting at L. I saw two or three cars stuck and then I pulled over because I don't want to get stuck either or bog out my engine. So now I'm just going to wait it out until the water's lower. Environment Canada estimates up to 125 millimeters of rainfall in Toronto. In the downtown core, manhole covers overflow and people sandbag to protect their businesses. While some stuck taxi drivers carried what they could in their hands, leaving their vehicles behind feeling helpless. Oh, I see maybe not too much water. That's why I go. Mayor Olivia Chow scheduling a last-minute news conference, telling residents all available resources are being deployed. City crews are out there clearing water basins so that uh, there's less flooding, so we can reopen the roads. Um, so far, emergency services are not impacted. At Union Station, video shows water pooling in a corridor leading to the Bay Street Go concourse, while the management and many condos scrambled to minimize building damage. <laughs> Toronto police say they were receiving a high volume of flooding calls and urged people not to dial 911 unless it was a life-threatening situation. Meanwhile, Toronto City Hall was dealing with its own emergency, using recycling bins to catch water leaking through the roof. In terms of the damage to the infrastructure, that will come later. Right now, we're just trying to make sure everybody's safe, uh, respond to the calls and the emergencies that we have, and, um, and, and then we'll deal with the aftermath. This is what Mom and I are stuck in. As the rain continued to batter down, back on the roads, a large portion of the Don Valley Parkway was shut down. Toronto fire crews said they rescued 12 people from flooding on the DVP, including a person from inside their vehicle and another from their car's roof. And the heavy rainfall was felt in many other areas as well. This was the scene in the Beaches neighbourhood, while visibility on Highway 403 was near zero. And on Finch Avenue West at Chesswood Drive, water gushed from higher ground spilling onto roadways. Sometimes we can't get to the locations due to flooding for us to try and get there to help people out. What I would say to anybody who's traveling in these areas, if you see water, drive to the weather conditions. Imploring for caution and patience during this weather event. Toronto Hydro says a number of its power stations, particularly in the West End, are still dealing with flooding. They say there's no timeline for when full power will be restored to its customers. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. Nathan and Michelle, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Raheem. And Raheem mentioned the DVP. We'll take a look at this. Vehicles forced to park on the usually busy highway. Traffic a nightmare today. People stuck for hours and those who did try to make it through the flooded sections faced a dangerous situation. Cars were no match for the overflowing Don River. They ended up submerged with drivers stranded. Toronto Fire, you heard Raheem touch on this. They had to rescue a dozen people who suddenly found themselves caught in the flooding. Just one of a series of problems on what proved to be a very busy day for emergency crews. At one point, they were getting 70 to 100 calls an hour. 
Uh, we've had a number of different calls today. We've had, uh, you know, well over, uh, you know, 50 elevator rescues. Uh, we, uh, we've had a significant number of, of uh, you know, technical water rescues. We rescued 12 individuals uh, from the Don River that were trapped in their cars uh, just at the Dundas Street Bridge. Officials say they hope to have all their calls for service cleared by early this evening. Now, and if transit was your travel choice today, you likely didn't escape the impact of the storm either. This was the crowd at Union, one of several stations disrupted by the heavy rainfall. And this was one of the reasons why. This video from Union Station midday, water pouring in, turning stairwells into waterfalls. And CTV Scott Lightfoot joins us live with more on how the storm disrupted transit today. Scott. Well, we're outside City Hall where Toronto's Emergency Management Committee has been meeting throughout the day and continues to meet. You know, you saw the roads, you heard about the power outages. One of the other things they're dealing with is transit disruptions. They've been happening throughout the day and they continued well into the afternoon rush. The busiest transit station in the country was, in parts, underwater today. Torrents of rainwater pouring down the stairs inside Union Station as commuters traipsed through the water. Large crowds could be seen trying to access GO trains. The city says some of the flooding affected areas used by GO Transit, and that, as well as the flooding outdoors, affected GO service. You've seen that Union Station, we had a power outage here earlier. We're still contending with rain across the network. And so you are seeing some service impacts on a few of our lines and delays and modifications across all of the network. Anybody going to Union Station, please walk to Union. The TTC was also heavily affected throughout the day. On line one, stations from King to St. Patrick were closed for a period of time. So too were several stations on line two, sending people onto shuttle buses. We are able to run subway service through Union Station. TTC service to Union was stopped throughout the afternoon commute as crews worked to clean up the water. Uh, safety is always the concern. We have crews that uh, are on site right now cleaning that up, uh, uh, vacuuming out the water, taking care of, of whatever those issues are. So uh, we've been able to keep some of Union Station going. Our expectation is it'll be a bit of a rolling opening of the various parts of Union Station as the, uh, the evening goes on. And those delays continue at this hour. Just checking the latest, the TTC saying Union Station still on bypass. So too is Lawrence West. The GO uh, Transit website showing a number of delays and changes to both bus and train service. You're being advised if you are taking TTC or trans GO Transit tonight to check websites before you head out. Morning Live outside City Hall. I'm Scott Live. But Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Scott. And while the transit troubles keep many from getting where they have to go, some folks never even left their homes, forced to manage all the water seen Keeping into basements and other cases pouring in from the ceiling. A snapshot of those struggles in moments. But before we get to the residential ruin, here's another live look at the vehicular woes. Our city news choppers flying over the DVP. A major Toronto artery partially shut down amid serious flooding. Now take a look at this hour. It is receding the levels. There are fewer cars out there. But it's going to take some time, and the city says after the water recedes, then they have to clean up. So we're talking a few more hours before things are all clear. Jess Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Jessica, you called it. Yeah, I did. But it's one of those things where you have to pack your patience. This is going to be a long day for everybody, even though the bulk of the rain is done. We're watching another wave right now making its way through the London area towards Hamilton as well, prompting a few more thunderstorm watches and warnings. Nothing for us here in the GTA, but we could see a passing shower. But it is nothing like what we saw earlier. We've already seen a few rounds of rain to kind of get through the first half of July. So the ground is super saturated. So the rain, there really was nowhere for it to go. Areas towards London, they saw, we're still getting numbers in, but upwards at a certain point of this afternoon, around 89 millimeters, and there's likely more on the way. For us here in the GTA, we're still waiting on numbers, but towards Billy Bishop, we've already seen about 30 to 40. So it was significant, and that's what's causing all of this. Again, we have some storm warnings and watches in towards London, through the Niagara region, through Hamilton, but for us here in the GTA, for now, we remain quite dry. Thankfully, as we do this cleanup temperature wise after the rain pushed through the sun came back out and the daytime heating really ramped things up. So we were at about 20 degrees earlier this afternoon. We're now up to 28 and it feels like 36. So it is very, very humid out there as we head into the evening. Although we're still watching for a few passing showers to make their way through the bulk of the really heavy rain is done. Thankfully, as we kind of begin the cleanup process. 
Coming up, I'll break down the next couple of days as we settle from the torrential rain event that we saw early on this morning. But right now, send things back over to Nathan and Michelle. All right, thank you, Jess. Widespread outages proved to be another big problem today. Large sections of the city in the downtown core, the West End and North without power. The city says at its height, 167,000 customers were affected. And at last check, just over 100,000 are without power this hour. Toronto Hydro telling us suspected flooding at a Hydro One transmission station seems to be the culprit. Couple that with the hundreds of calls for flooded basements tonight, and you sure have a recipe for frustration. Our Beth McDonnell took a tour of some of the damage today, and Beth, safe to say, a, a lot of unhappy homeowners. Michelle, what a mess. I was in a neighborhood in the Black Creek and Weston area, and I can't believe what I saw. I felt really bad for these homeowners, some describing water up to their waist at the height of it. Many are saying this was, you know, their knee. You know, there are, there are images of the street completely unrecognizable from, from what it is like when it's not torrential downpouring. And essentially, these people have rushed home today to deal with this mess. There is sewage back up. Their furniture is ruined. Obviously, it's going to have to be thrown out. And, you know, this area, I was in, sadly, they've actually dealt with flooding before. And so there's just a very high awareness of, of what they're dealing with and also extreme frustration almost in tears that you know one woman was had completely replaced her drywall and so they're just stuck they're just worried about what the future holds my message for government help me please doing something this not first time this many times happened this this happened two or three years ago today the same things and you need to take everything away this everything garbage who is help for me who is pay for this you have bedroom bathroom down here a cold room on the back um and yeah and everything uh has got to get replaced now our immediate priority is we have to pick up our son from daycare because they haven't they haven't had power for a couple hours so we have to figure out you know we've Throw everything up on the second floor of our house, figure out how to make sense of that, and then, you know, take care of him, right? He's still our main priority, but we also have this other stuff going on. Frustration is just the lack of power and internet. And so people on this street really banded together, saw people with buckets all getting together and moving water out of the driveway, sticking hoses down windows. So it was really something to see how people were coming together. I did reach the local councillor for this area to say, you know, what is going on here? Because they're really blaming a lack of infrastructure work that needs to be done. All right, that was CTV's Beth McDonnell on the issue of flooded homes in and around the city. You can keep up to date on the power outages and see more of the incredible images from today's downpour on our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. Traffic was certainly a mess today, but ask most drivers and they'll tell you, even without all these weather woes, traffic is a daily occurrence. Some bad, some are even calling it a congestion crisis. CTV's Natalie Johnson has the details. For years, the gridlock has been growing, but now Toronto traffic has reached a tipping point. The region's Board of Trade calling it a congestion crisis. This is actually the worst it's ever been. It makes me question everything. Including, for many, whether it is worth staying in this city. Data collected for the Board of Trade by Ipsos reveal that more than half of respondents have considered moving out of the region to escape the congestion. That's extraordinary. Congestion is very much uppermost in people's minds, and they want that resolved. 62% of people surveyed said they are reluctant to travel to work because of congestion. Of the age group 18 to 34, a key talent demographic, 64% have considered moving away, threatening a developing workforce exodus. I know the number of people I know who have said to me, you know, I never thought I'd say this. I've been born and bred in Toronto, but I'm really tired of the city. I'm, I'm finding it a grind. The stats suggest significant pressure on the ability of business to maintain both top talent and footprints within the core. Meanwhile, consumer behavior is changing because of the stifling traffic affecting the economy. 
42% of respondents say they avoid shopping or attending sports or entertainment events because of the traffic. 38% refrain from dining out. 31% avoid visiting family and friends. There's a sense that the city has not come to grips with this. Whether you're calling a huge problem, crisis, or um, yeah, any number of things, we, we I rather look at the solution that we need to have. It comes on the same day, though, as the mayor's executive committee was set to consider an accelerated construction plan for the gardener, but that report wasn't ready in time. The ball has been dropped at City Hall. It never should have gotten to this point, and we find ourselves in the unenviable position of trying to fix it after the fact. It's in discussion with the province, the actual construction piece. The current project of the gardener is being managed by the city, uh, so you know we've asked them from day one to look at uh, ways to speed this up. The city manager says the plan for the gardener considers bringing on more crews, changing the work schedule and harnessing innovative ways of getting it done. I think in the next few years we're going to have to look at the way we procure all projects and uh, perhaps look at a different matrix about what makes more sense. Is speed uh, more uh, important as we go through these next few years? The cost of quicker construction doesn't come cheap, but the cost of carrying on as is, is a congestion crisis. Natalie Johnson, CTV News. The idea of the City of Toronto taking over the Science Centre won't go too far if the city tries to do it alone. A new report from the city manager says it's not possible to sustainably fund and maintain the Science Centre under the current conditions. It also points out the Science Centre was operating at a financial loss before it closed, even with a substantial annual grant from the province. The Ford government announced the abrupt closure last month over state of repair concerns. Meantime, supporters of keeping the Science Centre and repairing it spoke out at City Hall. While Doug Ford is willing to spend up to a billion dollars to get beer and cocktails into gas stations a few months early, there seems to be no willingness to keep the Science Centre alive for future generations. The building is not decrepit. The building is not falling down. The narrative that Doug Ford has presented uh, is inaccurate. There is no way that it would cost a half a billion dollars, no way it would cost a half a billion dollars to do the necessary repairs. Councillors Josh Matlow and John Burnside are calling on the province to join a working group to keep the Science Centre open. Supporters estimate the cost of repairs would be $228 million, half of what was estimated by the province. They acknowledge it's significant, but point out the cost would be spread over 20 years. The Ford government marked an important step in the construction of the Ontario line. Work has now begun at Pape Station. Once complete, the 15-kilometer line will run between Ontario Place and the now-closed Science Centre at Don Mills and Eglinton. It will also connect with Line 2 of the TTC. When completed, this future station and the Ontario line will shorten commutes and alleviate crowding on existing lines, giving you precious time back in the day. The Ontario line is set to be ready by 2031. Canada's premiers are looking to make headway on improving access to health care. But they're also pushing back against the federal government over provincial jurisdiction. CTV's Judy Trin has more from Halifax. Privatization is a poison pill. Listen to the frontline workers, listen to the nurses, listen to the doctors and the models that are needed to keep people here. While health care workers and advocates rallied, Canada's premiers got to work behind closed doors. An estimated six and a half million Canadians do not have a family doctor. To find solutions, experts say the provinces need to get more information. Well, you need to know the list of people. How, you need to know exactly how many people and who they are that are in your province who don't have access to care and build out a plan. The Canadian Medical Association says the provinces need to recruit more doctors and retain them by building up the supports around physicians, allowing them to focus on patients and reducing their paperwork. That support would look like reducing our administrative burden, so easier electronic medical records, better interoperability of data, providing those infrastructure supports. Over the next decade, the federal government will transfer nearly $200 billion to the provinces and territories to improve health care. But premiers are increasingly concerned that Ottawa is attaching too many strings and encroaching on areas of their responsibility. 
We just would like them to use the, the process that is tried and true that has always worked, where we come to the table, we negotiate, we develop the side agreements, and then we develop some metrics to demonstrate that we're going to achieve them together. In the past year, the Trudeau minority government, backed by the NDP, has put in place a national dental care program for lower income families and passed legislation to provide free diabetic drugs and contraceptives to all Canadians. But these programs are not supported by the federal Conservatives, and some provinces want to opt out. Judy Trin, CTV News, Halifax. It's day two of the Republican National Convention. The focus today is on safety and immigration. Donald Trump was officially named as a Republican nominee last night. And he made a surprise appearance at the convention, his first since surviving an assassination attempt. Joy Malbin has more from Milwaukee. Donald J. Trump. Greeted to roaring applause, Donald Trump's first appearance, his ear bandaged after the attack. The former president seemed changed by the gravity of the moment. He wasn't supposed to appear after his brush with death, telling newspapers, I'm supposed to be dead. Some here say his survival is divine intervention. The devil came to Pennsylvania holding a rifle, but an American lion got back up on his feet and he roared! Trump reportedly is rewriting his speech to focus on a unifying, healing message for the nation. Sitting with his new running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, once a never Trumper. I never liked him. Now fully on board. Republicans here more unified than ever behind Trump and his MAGA movement. Awesome. Trump... Nikki Haley, who once called Trump unhinged and challenged him for the job, given a last-minute invite to speak tonight, she freed her delegates to support the Trump ticket. Thank you all very much. This love in a stark contrast to Democratic infighting. The embattled president fighting off allegations he's too old and should step aside. Joe Biden touching down in the battleground state of Nevada, condemned violent political rhetoric, but had to explain his own language when he told donors before or the shooting to put Trump in a bullseye. It was a mistake to use the word. I didn't, I didn't say crosshairs. I meant bullseye. I meant focus on him. Focus on what he's doing. Focus on, on, his, on his policies. Democratic billboards popping up here and in battleground states tie Trump to right-wing policies. Using his own words, Trump plans to be a dictator on day one. Meantime, the FBI has cracked the shooter's phone, trying to figure out why Thomas Crooks would try to assassinate Trump. Local police and witnesses noticed he was acting suspiciously and tried to warn police, who were reportedly inside the building, where Crooks was crouched on the top of the roof, armed with an assault rifle. The shooting described as the worst failure by the Secret Service in decades. Here's the director. The Secret Service is responsible for the protection of the former president. The buck stops with me. I am the director of the Secret Service. Secret Service has ramped up security around this convention and for the former president. And it's being reported that Trump's protection detail had already been beefed up before the assassination attempt due to intelligence about an Iranian threat. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Milwaukee. And for more on the convention, we're joined by CTV News chief political correspondent Vashi Capellos in Milwaukee. Vashi, we know Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis are scheduled to speak. What are you expecting? Well, we also just heard so is Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, a lot of really well-known uh, Republicans, pardon me, Nathan, who have criticized the former president on a number of occasions with DeSantis and Haley. I'm particularly interested to see how this room responds. About 24 hours ago, I was standing here when Mitch McConnell, who has also not been Trump's most ardent supporter, he's a supporter, just not as ardent a supporter as the people in this room, and they booed him as soon as he appeared on the Jumbotron. So I am very curious to see how Ron DeSantis and especially Nikki Haley, who was to the last bitter moment uh, Donald Trump's main rival for the Republican nomination, how she's received tonight. It's, it's coming up just within the next few hours. You know, after all that has happened over the past few days, has the rhetoric dialed down at all? It's a good question. I mean, that's what Donald Trump is promising. That's also what Joe Biden is promising. And to a certain degree, it has. I mean, even Trump himself, Joy referenced it in that package we just aired. When he arrived, he, he, he looked different. Like, he seemed more somber. He looked almost a little bit sad. Clearly, the weight of what had happened was being felt by him. And in some instances, I've heard a lot of Republicans up on stage sort of 
uh, offering caveats to the criticism of the White House, saying, you know, I'm not, I don't mean this personally, I'm, I'm criticizing policy. But in other instances, you do hear them going after Joe Biden in particular. There was a video last night making fun of his age and his gaffes and things like that. So I'm not sure the rhetoric is entirely dialed down. And right now, the program is about to get underway, is going to focus on immigration policy, one of the most heated, rhetorically speaking, issues for Republicans. So I'm very curious to see if they do in fact tone down that rhetoric, particularly on this issue tonight. All right, we'll find out. CTV's Vashi Capellos in Milwaukee. Thank you. Anytime, Nathan. Canada has spent $9 million for a luxury condo in Manhattan. It is to be used as the official residence for our Consul General in New York. The Steinway Tower is known as the world's thinnest skyscraper and is seen third from the right in this photo. The Canadian condo unit has three bedrooms, four and a half bathrooms. It also boasts a wet bar, a powder room, and plenty of space for entertaining. Global Affairs says the previous New York City residence is not up to code and doesn't meet the department's standards. The king visited Guernsey today, the first time he's been there since becoming monarch. The king was greeted by large crowds on the island and said he was very grateful for the warm welcome on the two-day visit. The king and his wife Camilla sampled local products, including beer and cheese, at an exhibition of island culture and heritage. They also unveiled a plaque commemorating their visit and met with members of a lifeboat crew. Coming up on CTV News, inflation eases in June more than expected. What's fueling the relief and what this could mean for the odds of another Bank of Canada rate cut? As of yesterday, we had already seen about a month's worth of rain so far, and we obviously have seen even more throughout the day today. We're still waiting for some numbers to come in, but so far, as of this morning, areas towards Billy Bishop, 34.3, and that was as of 8 a.m., and we know the real heavy stuff settled in as we got towards 10 a.m. to about noon. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long-range forecast, break down the rest of the evening and what we can expect as we clean up, and stay with us. We have another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. Canadians are paying slightly more for groceries, but less for gas and travel. Inflation cooled in June to 2.7 percent, down from the month before. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver has the details. Thousands of meals are served at the Ottawa Mission every day, but rising food costs mean the shelter's donations aren't going as far. As much as creative as Chef Rick is with his menus, we're still fighting to stretch a dollar so we can provide uh, this unprecedented increase in demand. There you go, enjoy your lunch. Today, chicken fingers, salad and fries are being served up. Ingredients that in January 2021 cost an average of $20.99. Now the same items and quantities are 20% more expensive at an average of $25.22. You can't raise money from your donors at 22% over three years. Uh, so uh, we're having to balance the scale somewhere here or there. Food inflation has come down since it peaked in 2023. But extreme weather, global supply chains and energy costs have meant it's still rising and slowing the decline of inflation overall. Last month, the consumer price index rose by 2.7%, down from 2.9% in May. We do think that we're going to see inflation continue to ease. So moving back towards the 2% target now, it's, you know, not a science. You certainly can't expect to be on the dot at two. And that positive outlook is likely good news for anyone paying interest. Next week, the Bank of Canada will make its next rate decision. And with inflationary pressures easing, experts say another rate reduction is likely. We're seeing some, uh, some progress, and I think it still support the Bank of Canada cut next week. Just because inflation is easing doesn't mean that consumers will necessarily see prices go down at the grocery store or at the pumps. Economists say it's important to remember that prices are still going up, just much slower than before. Annie Bergeron-Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa.
Well, inflation may have cooled, but we've we've been heating up today. Oh, yes. I mean, <laughs> with all the rain earlier, you didn't feel the heat quite so much. That was maybe the silver lining, but it was pretty bad earlier today. Now we have the sunshine, but it's steamy out there, and I'm thinking about all the folks who still don't have power. Ugh. I know, I feel for them, and it is a surprise how quickly things heated up. It's almost like in some spots nothing happened, but of course we've got the video. We know something happened. Something absolutely happened. We went from zero to 100 real quick when we went from the rain to the rain clearing up to the sunshine, and now this intense heat heat. We're still watching for a line of showers to make its way through right now, impacting Hamilton quite severely. But as we head in towards the evening, this really dissipates and then it's like it truly never happened. We have the remnants of it and we're still cleaning up as we speak as we head in towards the evening for all the folks out there who had their basements that flooded for the folks whose cars got stuck on the many roadways. We're still dealing with this. This is a shot from earlier today. It is improving slowly as the water starts to recede, but we're still seeing the impact. The water levels are so high. We've had a flood watch in place for quite some time over the past few days. We've had the watershed statement in place for the past few days because we've had so much rain to begin the month of July. We've already exceeded our month's average rainfall in the first 15 to 16 days. So as we get the numbers in later on, we'll see just truly how intense and how damaging this was. But for now, it is hot out there. We're at 28. It feels like 36. The winds are at 30, and it feels like 40. So after the rain let up, the sun came out, and all that daytime heating really started to cook things up a little bit. Into this evening, we'll sit around 19, so easier for sleeping. I know for some folks, it's been really challenging over the past few days, but we do ease a little bit as we head in towards tonight. Into the day tomorrow, it's another warm one, but we're closer to seasonal. 27, feeling like 32, so we're right on the button for where we should be. But that cloud cover we have in the morning will lift into the afternoon, and it's another really hot end to the day. There's that first wave that pushed through, obviously dropping that significant amount of rain. We're looking potentially at that 50 millimeter mark as we kind of get these numbers in, but we'll still wait until we get into the day tomorrow. As it pushes through another wave behind it, bringing some intense rain now again through areas that pass through Windsor, London. Now it's in towards Hamilton, likely to skirt through kind of the south end of the GTA as we head into the early part of our evening, but very, very quickly. There's that line right there. And as we head in towards about 7:30, 8 o'clock, the bulk of this is gone. And then as we head through the overnight, it's just some cloud cover out there. As we head into the start of the day tomorrow, really cloudy to get things going. But heading into the evening, things will push out and we have a really sunny second half to the day. So for everyone who has to clean up, for the city crews that have to clean up, there's a lot of water out there and a lot of damage. The sunshine over the next few days is going to be beneficial. As we head in towards the end of the week, just more sunshine on the way, although we do dip down a little below seasonal. So this heat and humidity, if you're not loving it right now, we do get a break as we head in towards the end of the week. But temperature wise tomorrow, right where we should be, but it'll still be that little bit of that sticky feeling when you walk out there, the relative humidity, the water vapor in the air is still pretty high, so it feels moist when you walk outside. It's kind of gross, but as we get in towards Thursday, Friday, things cool down, and it's reasonable to spend some time outside. So as we clean up and we get rid of all this water, folks clean out their basements. At least the sunshine is there to kind of help the process, right? We're not dealing with more heavy rain. Heading in towards our Saturday and Sunday, things start to rebound a little bit back towards a more seasonal market. And then as we look ahead towards next week, we're right where we should be. So it has been a kind of catastrophic start to the day. But as we head into the end of the day, Nathan, we get in towards the rest of the week, it is going to be beautiful. So there is a silver lining and some light at the end of this really rainy tunnel. I'll send it back to you. Good to know. Thank you, Jess. Thanks. Also tonight, sensory friendly shopping, efforts to inject inclusivity into the experience. We explore what a major Canadian retailer is offering for consumers who struggle in stores. Dealing with large crowds while shopping is not everyone's cup of tea. In fact, for people with autism, a concussion, or other conditions, it can be downright unbearable. It's why some stores are offering a sensory-friendly experience. CTV's health reporter Pauline Chan explores what Walmart calls more inclusive shopping for Canadians. A big Walmart store can be a lively, busy place, but for some, the experience is overwhelming, like Joy Alma, who has two sons with autism. Uh, the amount of preparation we'd have to put into coming to the store, you know, getting his um, noise-canceling headphones, all of that kind of thing, um, coming in with all of those sounds, the overwhelming um, experience of all that kind of sensory input coming at him at once, it would be overwhelming. But now on Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays before 10 a.m., screens and sounds at all 403 Walmart Canada stores will be low key. We turn down the music, 
and the paging. So paging is now left for emergency situations only. Walmart is the first major Canadian retailer to introduce sensory-friendly hours. The initiative began in the U.S. with a pilot project involving a few stores. It was developed with autism, concussions and other conditions in mind. Anybody who experiences sensory overload, um, so we know that it affects about 33% um, of the population um, and it can be diagnosed, it can be undiagnosed. Amber Fraser and her mom Mary Lisa both live with traumatic brain injuries from separate incidents. I just am super sensitive to lights and smells and sounds. It um, triggers a headache or a migraine that will last for hours. But the sensory friendly hours are a relief. It's so nice not hearing the um, the announcements coming on, Colleen. Just out of the blue, um, they just jolt you. Alma says other businesses, such as movie theaters, have also offered sensory friendly experiences, and she hopes it's a trend that continues. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Public health officials have confirmed the presence of mosquitoes with West Nile virus in Toronto. The batch of mosquitoes were caught uh, with traps that are tested once a week during warmer months. Public health says the risk of getting infected with West Nile virus in Toronto is currently low, but they still advise residents to take precautions to avoid bites. Those That includes wearing light-colored clothing, long pants, long sleeve shirts when outdoors, as well as applying insect repellent. Tiff announced what films will open and close this year's festival. Nutcrackers will premiere on September 5th. The dramedy stars Ben Stiller as a career-driven man who unexpectedly finds himself responsible for his mischievous orphaned nephews. Meanwhile, Rebel Wilson's directorial debut, The Deb, will close the festival on September 15th. The musical comedy follows two cousins in an Australian town as they embark on a journey of self-discovery and seek dates for their debutante ball. Filmmaker David Conroy's work hasn't been selected for the Toronto International Film Festival yet, but perhaps one day it will. Conroy is a film familiar face to uh, those of us in the studio here at CTV. His day job is a lighting technician at Bell Media. CTV's Andrea Case reports. Behind the scenes, there is a crew of people working to put on this show for you. From TSN to CTV News Toronto, we can often find David Conroy sitting at the lighting board. Conroy hails from Ireland. By fluke, you know. Mm. I studied film and production in, in Ireland and uh, I was working in an Irish television-based studio and uh, they were like, you want to do grip or you want to do lighting? And I was like, I'll do lighting. And that's basically it. While traveling, he met a Canadian woman and moved to Toronto in 2008. But it wasn't until he saw the film Avatar he was inspired to return to his true passion, filmmaking. I worked my way up, basically. I did a one-minute film, a five-minute film, 20-minute, 40-minute, and then now uh, this is my first feature film. This weekend, his first feature-length film will be screened at the Markham International Film Festival. What's your favorite scary movie? Stab, stab. It's called The Treatment, about a once famous rebel film director who cast actors to rehearse his ultimate and final script. Will they make the cut? Conroy wrote, produced and directed the film, even paying the actors out of his own pocket. I worked in Qatar in, in, for the World Cup and saved a bunch of money there and uh, I said, I'm going to make a film. You've heard the phrase lights, camera, action. Well, in this studio, the lights are really important. In fact, there's over 100 of them in a grid up above, and David can control each and every one of them with a touch of a finger. Or fingers. He's not quitting his day job just yet, and that's a good thing, because here at CTV News Toronto, the show must go on. What's your goal? Um, to... To leave us? Yeah, to have somebody hire me to make films. He's already working on his next film. His two daughters hope one day he'll cast them in one of them. Andrea Case, CTV News. I was driving and the car just stuck because it's like so much water, it's so deep. Updating our top stories, an estimated 125 millimeters of rain fell in Toronto today. Police say they received a lot of flooding calls as the mayor assured residents all available resources were being deployed to respond to the downpour. A large stretch of the Don Valley Parkway was shut down. 12 people were rescued there. 
We've seen that Union Station, we had a power outage here earlier. We're still contending with rain across the network. And so you are seeing some service impacts on a few of our lines and delays and modifications across all of the network. Mm, yep, there it is. Parts of Canada's busiest transit station were flooded today. Commuters had to deal with a lot of water. TTC service to Union was stopped in the afternoon as crews cleaned up the mess. Several TTC stations were also closed because of all the water. I know the number of people I know who have said to me, you know, I never thought I'd say this. I've been born and bred in Toronto, but I'm really tired of the city. I'm, I'm finding it a grind. The Toronto Region's Board of Trade calls it a congestion crisis. Data from a survey shows more than half of respondents have considered moving, and over 60% said they're reluctant to travel to work because of congestion. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. Toronto stocks hit another record today, boosted by gold miners. Andrew Bellabina and Bloomberg brings us the latest in business. Hello there. Toronto's Composite Index closed above 22,900 today for the first time, with every stock group moving higher except for energy, which slipped as oil prices fell. Gold stocks jumped 3% as bullion traded at record levels above $2,470 US an ounce. Index heavyweight Shopify gained almost 9% after an upgrade to buy at Bank of America. And stocks were also lifted by the prospect of another rate cut by the Bank of Canada. The U.S. S&P 500 closed at a new high as investors continued to rotate into smaller companies at the expense of tech mega caps. And it's looking more and more as though Canadians will get that interest rate cut on Wednesday of next week. Canada's overall inflation rate was just 2.7% year over year in June, down from 2.9% a month earlier. Price pressures have fallen to the lowest since the start of 2021. City economist Veronica Clark says, quote, we continue to expect the Bank of Canada will lower rates at each meeting this year. And finally, China's economic malaise has worsened a slump in the market for expensive watches. Swiss watchmaking conglomerates Richemont and Swatch have been hit by a China-led pullback that has also hurt luxury black brands including Burberry, Hugo Boss and Gucci. It's a sharp come down for an industry that thrived on purchases by watch lovers who are inspired by flashy social media posts. Swatch, whose fancy brands include Bruguet and Blancpain, saw China sales plunge 30% in the first half of this year. On the markets, the Canadian dollar was at 73.15 US cents, up a fraction. WTI Oil, North America's benchmark, changed hands at $80.76, down $1.15. Western Canadian Select Oil traded at $67.10 US a barrel, down 23 cents. And the TSX Composite ended at its new high of 22,995.39, up just under 244 points. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. The federal government intends to ban the installation of oil furnaces in new construction as early as 2028. The phase-out of heating oil would be accompanied by more financial support to buy and install heat pumps. Instead, the Liberals say their green building strategy released today is designed to drive energy efficiency improvements while addressing affordability and emissions. It seeks to accelerate retrofitting of existing buildings and ensure buildings are climate resilient. Toronto housing starts were down 60% last month compared to a year ago. Overall, the annual pace of housing starts in the country fell 9% from May to June. Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says the numbers were noticeably lower in Vancouver by 55%. But in Montreal, housing starts rose 226%. Tonight, pumping the brakes on auto thefts across Canada. It's a promising step that a lot of the things that have been discussed over the last couple of years are beginning to take hold. But warnings for a bumpy road ahead as the crisis is far from being eradicated. Later on CTV National News.
And a reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available as a download every weeknight. And a special greeting to those of you listening to the newscast live on News Talk 1010. Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV Finally tonight, a new interactive art display in Vancouver is taking people to new heights. And offering a great way to help get or stay in shape. The stairway to nowhere is called Home and Away. It was nearly 10 years in the making and was first approved in 2015 at a price tag of nearly half a million dollars. People can climb the 17 meter tall installation and sit on one of the rows of bleacher seats. The city's mayor hopes it will become an iconic landmark. Well, it'd be a sweet workout. Mm. Gotta get your steps in. We yeah. have our own little sudden pop-up landmarks in the city today. The base <laughs> of the DVP, it's now a yeah. full river. It's been one of those days where you look across your social media and you're seeing flooding everywhere. The rain does not discriminate, so it's impacted literally everybody. But the good news is, as we kind of wrap up our day, despite seeing maybe a few more pop-up showers into the early evening, we are done with that really heavy rain and we are getting a reprieve. We are finally getting a little sunshine. We're still looking at some rainfall warnings in towards areas just southwest of Niagara, areas towards London. They're looking at some severe thunderstorm watches still, but we are seeing these start to dissipate, thankfully. There's that little Little tiny cell right there the bulk of it staying south of us but overall we are through the worst of it thank you jess that's it for us but omar sachidina has you covered tonight at 11 for ctv national news followed by zoraida allman with our next local newscast at 11 30. in the meantime our coverage continues anytime on cp24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca and we'll leave you tonight with more images from today's record rainfall for jessica smith and the whole team here at ctv news thank you for watching and have a good night